10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I want you to forget everything about your cancer. I want you to forget everything about what your doctors have told you. I want you to forget everything about your treatments. And I want you to start with a blank slate. This is Dr. Tommy Anelli, and this is the Croc Podcast. I want you to imagine that you're a Boy Scout. Now, you know we promised that this podcast was going to be non-gender, non-genderized, non-discriminatory, but just for the purpose of this analogy, and you know I always start our podcast with a story or an analogy, you're going to be a Boy Scout, but you're not just any Boy Scout. You are the Cadillac of Boy Scouts. You are... The Eagle Scouts, Eagle Scouts, Eagle Scouts, Boy Scout. That's how good you are. And you live, breathe Boy Scouts. And since you were a little Cub Scout, you've always been taught that it was your job, your duty to do a good deed, to turn a good deed every day. And of course, the the visual on this um, from from the olden days is, is a Boy Scout trying to help a little old lady crosses the street and uh, goes up to the old lady and takes her arm and takes her bags and walks her across a busy Manhattan intersection and and of course the scout feels great, the old lady feels great, everybody's happy. But what happens when that boy scout approaches the little old lady and tries to walk her across the street and the little old lady doesn't want to be walked across the street, she feels very very fine and she feels very confident and competent that she could do it herself. Imagine what that Boy Scout must feel. He must feel rejected. He must feel silly. He must feel embarrassed. And my dear Crockers, that's exactly how I feel right now. We have been on the Defining Survivorship module for the last three weeks. We've talked about my dear um Uh, respected Dr. Fitzhugh Mullen and his seasons of survivorship and his thought processes when he was diagnosed with cancer in the 1970s, how he found a landscape that was very virgin toward how cancer survivors, how cancer patients uh, were unique and different. And Angel, who's sitting next to me, my dear friend and podcast guru, my producer, my co-host, Imagine my interest when I was doing the research to try to define survivorship during this module when pretty much everything I read, everything I learned about survivorship that I tried to pass down to our listeners dealt with the uniqueness of survivorship and the uniqueness of the cancer patient. How a cancer patient had so much in common with other cancer patients how cancer survivors have to deal with a unique set of circumstances. Uh, They have to deal with their treatments. They have to deal with their side effects. They have to deal with that fear, that complete, um, absolute terror. And here we are speaking about survivorship, about the terminology, how patients don't have to earn that red badge of courage and live five years to be called the survivor and how we try to attempt to to um, acknowledge their stoic battle um, with the term survivorship. And and as I'm doing my due diligence, I come across an article, and I look at this article, and the article's title, Is It Time to Reconsider the Term Cancer Survivor? And when I first saw this article, I thought to myself, well, should I even bother reading this article? I mean, let's be real. I mean, the cancer survivors really need to be 
acknowledged and they need to be uplifted and they need to be supported and advocated for. But I thought to myself, what if a cancer survivor doesn't want to be referred to as a survivor, or I should say a cancer patient doesn't want to be referred to as a survivor? So I thought on this, and, and I thought on this, and I read the article once, and I read the article again, and I read the article again, and at first I have to tell you, I was all huffy and puffy, you know, how could anybody not want to support a cancer survivor, call them cancer survivors? But tonight we have a very, very special treat. I reached out, and you have to understand that I reached out to two of the main authors of this paper who, and I'm, again, I'm going to introduce them, you're going to meet them. I mean, we're not talking about hillbilly doctors like me. We're talking about two national champions. We're talking about two people, really, that are so professionally um, accomplished um, that once I started to read the article and give it some serious attention, it became very clear to me that we needed to bring this up as an alternative because when people and, and cancer patients listen to this podcast, they want information. And module one, again, we're a brand new raw podcast uh, for the cancer patient to empower them with information. Our first module is actually trying to define survivorship and try to build that foundation with a really strong foundation. And I don't think the foundation can be built strongly without listening to another point of view. So I wanted to take a few minutes during the first part of this podcast, and you guys are in store for a treat today, because we're going to actually do two parts to today's podcast, the part where I am doing now, introducing you guys to the authors introducing you to the concept of the paper, um, the actual um, structure of the paper, and then we're going to cut out, and then we're going to bring um, our two professors on, and we're going to ask them to explain their paper, where it came from, uh, what their thought process was, explain their data, and I think that at the end of this two-part session, I think it's going to be very provocative I think you as a cancer patient, and I'm going to say cancer survivor for now, um, are going to have to decide for yourself how you feel about the term survivorship, how you feel about the term survivor. You're going to want to decide whether or not that is the terminology that you feel comfortable with. So let's talk a little bit about this paper. Is it time to reconsider the term cancer survivor? So this article was published in the Journal of Psychosocial Oncology. Uh, it was published uh, online January 2019. Um, there are several authors, and the two authors we're going to be speaking to today are Dr. Leonard Berry and Dr. Katie Deming, um, but we do want to recognize all the authors on this paper. Um, Scott Davis, Andrea Godfrey Flynn, and Jeffrey Lander Casper. I hope I pronounced everybody's name correctly. And they're from all sorts of different institutions. Um, Dr. Burry is from the Mays Business School at Texas A&M. Uh, we have a, a Dr. Deming is from um, Kaiser Permanente in, in Northwest over in Oregon. Uh, and the other doctors are from anywhere from uh, Wisconsin to uh to the University of Houston, to the University of San Diego, and we are very grateful for the work that they've done. So just to look at the purpose of this uh, article, according to their abstract, was to improve understanding of how people diagnosed with cancer perceive the term cancer survivor and what influences those perceptions. The design of the paper is to actually quantify and qualify, and I'll explain that to you, uh, patients' reactions to the term um, in the study. The sample size is large and it's mainly women who have experienced breast cancer and belong to the Susan Love Research Foundation's Army of Women. And the conclusion of the paper is that using the term, the blanket term survivor, to label a diverse group is problematic. Although the term offers a positive identity for some, others reject it or find it offensive at least for patients like those represented in this study. 
If cancer patients are going to be labeled, they should choose the one that is most empowering and reflective of their experience. So the implications for us as caregivers is that language used in providing care or describing patients is controllable and there is evidence that exists that a particular term has the potential to inflict psychological harm. Uh, so we really need to dig into this um, you know, before we move forward to make sure that the cancer patient is able to choose how they want to be referred to. Very powerful, provocative paper. We're pleased as punch to be able to have these great researchers and these great clinicians and academicians um, speak uh, about their work. And, and I'm just, I can't tell you how happy I am. So let's talk a little bit about a published paper. So my job as your, as your um, CROC podcast uh, concierge is, is to try to not make you understand an academic paper, but try to bring it to a level that everyone could understand. So, of course, you know, when I use words like qualitative and quantitative, they, they d- deserve a bit of an explanation. So, a qualitative paper or qualitative study really can't be expressed as a number. Uh, It can be expressed as words or objects or pictures, observations or symbols, whereas a quantitative study can be expressed as a number. So it's a data count, so numbers, statistics, and things like that. And the thing that's so actually wonderful about this paper and gives it so much legitimacy is the fact that it's it's a, a combination of quantitative and qualitative. So in many times, um, you know, people who have done these studies, and there have been studies, you know, trying to figure out terminology, try to identify terminology, try to explain terminology. Uh, if there's an open-ended question, uh, it may not really truly express how a patient feels about the term. So going backwards before we move forward, um, the study basically wants to ask if the term cancer survivor is appropriate. Um, The study wants to find out, is a single definition reasonable? Um, Do cancer patients identify with this this, uh, terminology? And should we make changes or improve our understanding of the cancer patient's um, label? And apparently, it is very important. And like I said, Angel, I feel like I got hit by a truck. Um, But you know what? As old as I am, I hope that I'm not too old to learn new things. And, and I certainly look forward to, uh, to speaking to the professors regarding their thoughts and explanation of, the, of their paper. Um, I also wanted to tell you that the term survivor, um, according to Dr. Mullen and his seasons of survivorship, and then he went on to um, start the National Coalition Cancer Survivorship, I think these pioneers never really envisioned uh, the survivor that was going to be the label, that it would become a ubiquitous term, that everybody was going to be using this term. I, I, I think they thought cancer survivors really are not um, victims. I think they needed to really articulate the unique needs of these patients. But by using the, the label survivor, what ended up happening is that everybody got pushed into one sort of bucket. And I think that's, that's really what the authors were trying to say was maybe this just isn't right. Maybe we need to re, sort of rethink this. So before we get too much into the podcast series, I think it's good that we give this other point of view. Um, the other thing is it is a convenient term. So survivorship, cancer survivor, it's convenient. It's simple. But we want to find out if it's just. There have been 23 studies, according to this paper, a meta-analysis of 23 studies where most people did identify with the term uh, cancer survivor, but others did reject it. Now, Angel, can you think of any reason why a person, a cancer, a cancer patient, would reject that term? No. Right. It's Absolutely. right it's, as a not as two non-cancer patients. Yeah. But think about this. What about? the jinx, right? In Italian, right? I was raised in an immigrant family. We used to call it the malocchia. You never wanted to jinx yourself. There is a fear that you would jinx yourself if you call yourself a survivor, right? Also, you don't want to be disrespectful for patients who passed away from cancer. 
what if your cancer is is an early stage cancer that's going to be cured and the person sitting next to you in the waiting room has metastatic cancer and is not doing well? Maybe by that patient who's doing well, they might feel guilty that they're calling themselves a survivor when really the person next to them is really the hero to them and they feel maybe not worthy of that term. And other people, again, cancer patients are unique in their journey, in their health journey. Um, So by us, I guess, pigeonholing these patients into this term, um, they may lose their sense of individuality. They may lose that sense of themselves. Um, And that's another reason why it's potentially, you know, insulting um, by calling everyone a survivor. Um, In 2017, just to give you, again, we've talked about this in the podcast, uh, there there are going to be, there were 1.6 million people diagnosed with cancer in the United States with only 600,000 deaths. So there's a misalignment between the living and the dead. Um, So should a cancer casualty um, be called a survivor? So everyone that I've ever spoken to, and again, 35-year career, um, has told me personally that cancer has changed their life. Uh, In the paper, there were two interesting um, two um, clinicians who, who were cancer survivors. One was going shopping in Sears to buy a frying pan, and the salesman told her that the frying pan had a lifetime guarantee, and she wouldn't buy the frying pan because she she felt that the frying pan shouldn't outlive her. I, I just thought that was, you know, was 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 a wonderful uh, analogy. Uh, there was an oncologist with uh, prostate cancer who uh, phrased it: "Basically, the ground doesn't feel as solid to me anymore." Quote unquote. So, really, I think everyone agrees and universally agrees that cancer does change their life, and not always for the worse. Most of the time, the stories I've heard are for the better. So there is a clouded picture. Some patients embrace, some patients don't, some reject, some patients don't even care, really, to be honest with you, and some find it offensive. So again, we're going to look at design limitations with these other studies, not this study. Well, all studies have limitations, and I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Deming and Dr. Berry will agree. Um, and I'm sure they will be the first ones to identify the shortcomings of their paper. Um, but the design limitations with qualitative data, their small sample sizes, and again, those forced uh, choice endorsements may not really reflect the patient's true feelings. Um, so example, uh, if you were going to ask a, a cancer patient if they want to be termed a victim, uh, whether they want to be termed that they had the disease, whether they term they were survivors, conquerors, um, a yes or no answer doesn't usually do it. So that's that's one of the really awesome things about this particular paper. It does it goes much deeper. Uh, in the nine studies, four of which were breast, um, the percentage of patients uh, accepting the term survivor were very high. Um, but as we look at prostate patients and, and five other studies, that number actually goes down, and actually in prostate cancer, it becomes a negative a negative value. Um, so what we're going to do at this point is we're going to we're going to sign off for the introduction. Actually, you know what? I want to do one more thing. I want to actually introduce our speakers before we even meet them because I'll tell you, it takes a podcast just to introduce the the accomplishments of these fine people. So. I was, uh, Angel and I have been emailing Dr. Berry and Dr. Deming pretty much all week and trying to figure out a time. Um, They're, you know, Central uh, U.S. and and West Coast U.S., and we're on the East Coast. We're trying to figure out everybody's clinic schedules and teaching schedules or whatever. And and when I was first corresponding with Dr. Berry and, and Dr. Deming, it was remarkable how incredibly helpful they were how incredibly genteel and collegial they were. And I said to Dr. Berry, I said, you know, in my long experience, I've met some really uh, high-powered people, and I've noticed there's a direct correlation between how accomplished a person is and how nice, nice they are. And these two people couldn't have been any nicer or more accommodating to us. Um, Dr. Berry is the univer- is a university distinguished professor of marketing, regents professor, and holds the M.B. Zale Chair 
in retailing and marketing leadership in the Mays Business School at Texas A&M. He is a presidential professor for teaching excellence. He is a senior fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Denmark. He has published 13 books, all of which really center around healthcare and improving healthcare for patients. Um, he has won the Chef Gold Medal, the American Marketing Association, William Wilkie Marketing for a Better World Award, the Paul D. Converse Award, the AMA McGraw Hill Irwin Distinguished Marketing Educator Award, the, Contr- the Career Contributions to Servicing Services Marketing Award from the AMA, Outstanding Marketing Educator Award, Fellow of the American Marketing Association, Distinguished Achievement Award in Teaching, Distinguished Achievement Award in Research, the highest bestowed honor to any faculty member. In 2014, he was inducted into the Arizona State University's Cary School of Business Hall of Fame. So we've got a Hall of Famer that we're going to be talking to tonight on our little little podcast. I mean, Dr. Berry... The reason why I'm doing this now is because if I ever asked you if I could do this, you would absolutely say no. So I'm going to do this now. And then comes Dr. Deming. So Dr. Katie Deming uh, is a Dukey uh, through and through, uh, Duke University School of Medicine, uh, internship, residency in Duke University, as anyone knows, is one of the best universities. I am the black sheep of my family. I'm the only one who didn't go to Duke. My daughter has her degree from Duke. And actually, my daughter uh, is, emphasis is on women's health. And, and Dr. Deming, actually, as, as I believe as a student, um, was actually uh, went overseas to do, uh, to do uh, cervical cancer research, um, I want to say, in Haiti. Uh, when she was a student. I mean, we're talking about such a wonderful human being. And think about this, right? We're men, right? We don't really think about breast cancer, bras and things. Dr. Deming also probably rightfully, obviously, saw that women with breast cancer can't really use a regular bra, right? Mm -hmm. You need specialty, um, you know, a specialty item. And she not only does her medicine, she is also a, a an entrepreneur and a businesswoman. Um, tremendous um, design awards for probably the best bra uh, for radiation patients, according to the Business Insiders magazine in 2020. Uh, University of Oregon Executive MBA uh, competition winner. Um, her She's on the Susan Komen uh, Board of Directors. She's a top doc in the Portland North uh, American Northwest uh, area. Um, the Rankin Research Resident Research Award, uh, the Dr. Bentel Award for Outstanding Physics Research, the Michael Nathan Research Award winner, Award for Academic Excellence, uh, Academic Performance Award, Howard Hughes Research Fellowship, and multiple papers. Um, many of which were published in the Red Journal, which in my world is sort of like the Bible of radiation oncology, and we all dream of having a paper published in this journal. And I'm just very excited to have these two people uh, join us today. As I said, I could do an entire podcast, an entire podcast, just on the accomplishments of these two people. So I'm going to end the first part of the podcast now. I've done their introductions, which they are going to be horrified about when they hear it. Um, but that's okay because I'm sure they're very humble people. And uh, I look forward to joining you on the other side of this podcast with my friend Angel uh, to talk about the paper itself and to have them explain their, uh, their research and their data. Uh, peace, friends. Talk to you soon. Five, four, three, two, one. Howdy, Crockers. This is your friend and Survivorship Concierge, Tommy and Ellie, here, and I couldn't be happier to introduce two of the most wonderful, accomplished scientists, researcher, clinician um, that I've actually come across um, to talk about the article that we've already sort of discussed in, in the precursor to this podcast. I have with me Dr. Leonard Berry. 
and Dr. Katie Deming, uh, who are going to uh, talk to us about that paper. Uh, before we get to that, guys, I just wanted to say hi. 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 And I was uh, talking off air just um, briefly, uh, kind of joking around, saying that when I was researching uh, our module on defining survivorship, um, how this paper sort of really stuck out, um, how this paper really got into my soul, uh, how this paper really provoked me to sort of open my mind to something different. It was that cold splash of water on a on a hot day, just kind of just really waking me up. So um, from what I said prior, um, we've been defining survivorship using the model from Dr. Mullen uh, and his, his seasons of survivorship, his Sentinel paper going back to the New England Journal of Medicine from 1985. And before that, as we've said several times, um, survivorship at that point wasn't really defined. I mean, to be a cancer survivor, you were really weren't a survivor. You're more of a victim. And if you happen to live five years at that time, uh, then maybe you would be called a survivor, maybe not. And Dr. Mullen's personal experience with his cancer and his leadership in, in cancer, um, um, the, can- the care of cancer and can- care of cancer survivors, cancer patients, uh, really sort of um, put a new, I guess, a new model on how to manage, you know, how to talk about cancer patients, how to deal with them, uh, how to deal with their long-term side effects, both physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I'm reading all these great papers and going through everything. And all of a sudden I get to your paper guys. And I'm saying, is this possible that, is it time to reconsider the term cancer survivor? And I thought to myself, well, let me read it again. And I read it again. And then I read it again. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, my, my, uh, <laughs> my, um, my feelings started to soften. My mind started to open. And I thought to myself, you know what, I want to reach out to these people. I have to see, you know, exactly what they were thinking because again, provoking articles, uh, original research is so rare uh, and really needs to be um, evaluated, really needs to be discussed. And I really want to bring this uh, to you as our cancer survivor uh, constituency. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say, and, and you guys are gonna, not going to be mad at me because you didn't know that I did this, but I've already introduced you in my previous podcast and told everybody how awesome you both were. And uh, I knew you wouldn't let me do that, but but I did it anyway. Um, but I guess I want to ask, uh, actually, one of the points I wanted to bring up was that your work um, is certainly so far ranging and so not just defined by this paper, but you both have devoted your entire careers, your, your probably your entire visage, you know, to making a life better for our patients. So, so Dr. Len Berry from Texas A&M, uh, Dr. Katie Deming from, um, from uh, Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Permanente in, in Portland, um, just two leaders in just healthcare improvement, making quality of life, making the experience of treatment, making the experience of of the cancer journey better for everyone. Um, I can't say enough good things about you guys. I am so grateful you're here for this brand new, uh, raw, you know, still unproven podcast. Uh, the fact that you've spent some, you were spending time with us. Uh, is just so impressive. And I thank you both for your time. Of course. So yeah. I guess my first question, guys, is like, what were you thinking? <laughs> like, let's, you know, you know, my story, you know, the story of, you know, the survivorship terminology. Um, you know, how did you guys start, you know, brainstorming, you know, doing this revolutionary paper about, you know, the term survivorship and how it might not apply or may not fit all the one size fit all. Uh, I'll start, Tom, with with that question, uh, because there's a very clear answer to how we got started. And that was a phone call between me and Katie. And uh, Katie uh, indicated to me that in her practice as a radiation oncologist, in her practice, uh, a number of patients in one way or the other had told her about their discomfort with the term or the label cancer survivor. 
And so Katie uh, contacted me. We knew each other not well at that time. We know each other much better now because we've worked together for uh, a number of uh, on a number of papers. Uh, but at that time, we didn't know each other well. But we knew each other well enough for her to contact me, and she said, "Lynn, uh, do you have an opinion on this phrase, this label, cancer survivor?" And I did, and we talked about it on the phone. But that's that's how it all started. It was really Katie's, uh, Katie listening to her patients. Katie, what would you add to that story? Yeah, so actually, this came from more than just my practice as a radiation oncologist. Um, I was a cancer um, leader. I was designing a whole cancer service line for the Northwest region of the United States for Kaiser Permanente. And as part of our design process, I truly believe in incorporating the people who are gonna receive the care at every level of the design process. And so we had a advisory panel of cancer patients and their family members, and they were advising advising us on all of the different aspects of this program. And as we were talking about different parts of the program, survivorship came up, which is, as we know, um, but maybe your audience doesn't know, is that once a patient finishes treatment, all of the, you know, most cancer centers call the aspect of um, going through, you know, wellness and surveillance checks after you complete your cancer treatment as a survivorship program. And as we were using that terminology, one of our advisors who had stage four disease said, you know, I really feel uncomfortable with that word. And I think it's just for me because I have stage four disease and I'm not a survivor. And I will never have access to this program because I'm never going to be done with treatment. And so at first I thought maybe it was just related to this stage four issue. But then around the table, they all started talking. And for very different reasons, they all had this kind of resistance to the term. And I found it fascinating because as a provider, I had just never even thought about it. I had just said, this is just a term that we use. And it seemed like it was, you know, done for all the reasons that you said um, with Dr. Mullen, it's like empowering, um, trying to, you know, give this, um, you know, group so that they have an identity and it can be for empowerment and wellness. Um, but this conversation really started something within our program. And for me, my job as a designer and as a leader of a cancer program is to number one, listen to the people that we're designing for. And so this started this, you know, question in my mind. And so we talked about it. And could we, you know, name these programs something different than survivorship? Um, and as that you know, happened, I started to ask my patients, you know, how do you feel about this term survivor, you know, us using this in the clinic? Is it empowering for you? Or do you have other feelings? And as I started to, you know, explore this both with our advisory council and with my own patients, I realized there was probably a question um, that could be studied better um, in a way that was more open-ended that hadn't been done before. And that's when I reached out to Dr. Barry because he's so well respected um, in the kind of cancer service um, research line and really just thought maybe that we could do something to get more information about, you know, how people really feel about the term. Yeah. And Tom, when... a novel, right? To actually ask a patient what they want to be referred to as <laughs> just absolutely so, so brilliant. Um, uh, yet. So, you know, why didn't we think of this before? Right. So Tom, when, when Katie and I first talked about it, uh, my, initial, my initial reaction to Katie, and, and it became a big part of our uh, presentation in our paper, my initial reaction was, Katie, that, you know, this doesn't make much sense. My background is as a marketing professor I'm a professor in Mays Business School at Texas A&M, and my focus is in service uh, to the customer and 
for the last 20 years, it's been really a focus on the healthcare customer, the patient. And, and so in, in responding to Katie's question to me, what do you think about this term, cancer survivor? The first thing that occurred to me is, is one of the first things we teach our marketing students. And that is you're playing with fire when you use a single term to label a heterogeneous population. That was my first response. And then as I thought about it more, I believe in that first phone call, but maybe it was in a second phone call. As I thought about it more, it occurred to me, this doesn't make conceptual sense. The, the definition of cancer survivor that started with uh, Dr. Mullen and, and his group uh, that he formed uh, and that had then been extended to uh, health systems, cancer centers, the National Cancer Institute uses the definition. The definitions are all the same and, and they basically uh, revolve around the idea that you are a cancer survivor from the moment of diagnosis for as long as you live. You are a cancer survivor. Well, we know that not all cancer patients live. Uh, uh, many die from their cancer, unfortunately. And so conceptually, I didn't know how you can refer or define cancer survivor as anyone diagnosed with cancer who is alive, when in fact, there are many who do not survive cancer. So that it was conceptually inconsistent to me uh, as an academic. And, and those dis early discussions with Katie is, is what got, her, got us started. But I mean, from my point of view, I have to say that your unique, your unique perspective as a um, non-clinician, as someone in the marketing industry actually turned out to be such a, um, uh, if I might um, be so bold as saying, such a, a great asset to the study um, because we as clinicians, you know, don't have that sort of fresh look, um, that unique perspective. And, and I think that's what really assists the paper in, in being so original. And I wanted to ask you guys follow up that question with, um, you know, again, I've read all the papers, you know, piles and piles of papers, and none of them have done what you did with, with doing a quantitative and a qualitative aspect. And, and I was wondering if you guys can um, speak to that um, and, and how you designed the study with the grad students and the open-ended questions and how you were able to get the depth um, that you were able to achieve in this paper um, that had really uh, eluded everyone prior. Yeah, I can, I can start in the, and then Katie can chip in. Um, what we, there, there is a literature, a, quite a big literature on uh, the appropriateness of the term cancer survivor. When, when Katie and I, and, and we also added others to our research team, but when we got started, the first thing we did, of course, is look at that literature to see what was out there. And the literature, the findings are all over the place. It, it, it was, you know, I've done a lot of research in my career, and I don't think I've ever seen a topic where the findings are so disparate, so uh, uh, different from one study to the next to the next. You know, some studies showed very positive response to the term cancer survivor. Other st studies showed the opposite. Some studies showed kind of a mixed bag, depending upon the kind of cancer a patient had. And, uh, <clears throat> but as a, as a researcher, when I read those studies, I saw a, a lot of weakness in the methodologies that I felt explained the difference in the findings. And so in designing our study, one of our primary goals, if, if probably our primary goal, Tom, was to uh, try to overcome the weaknesses in the existing literature. And that is why we measured uh, patients' uh, alignment or acceptance 
of the term cancer survivor three different ways, two quantitative ways and one open-ended way. We wanted to know what they thought about the term, but we also wanted to learn more about why they felt the way they felt. Katie, anything to add to that? No, I think that exactly as Len has said, that there was such limitations of what had been done before and that the results were so varied and based on the way that they had approached the question, whether it was binary, you know, either yes, you like the terms cancer survivor or you don't, or the um, questions were asked with um, multiple choice where the patient was forced to choose an answer we wanted to really understand better kind of this qualitative aspect of if patients were able to use their own words, what would those things say? And were there themes around the limitations of this term and what made them feel either positive or negative about the term? Just uh, tremendous. And, and I was gonna actually ask um, Katie, if you didn't mind, um, going through some of those uh, very powerful, powerful, powerful um, statements in some of those open-ended questions, which really explained to me, it actually was the the, the force behind uh, being able to uh, digest this information. And, and that's the table three and four in your paper, you know, about, you know, what made, what would make a person, a cancer patient, um, not relate to that, um, to that label. Yeah. You know, so, and what's interesting is a lot of these quotes that we saw in the qualitative um, aspect of the study really resonated with the things that I had heard from the patient advisors, as well as my patients in the exam room. Um, and so some of these comments, these are quotes from um, women in our study, or I guess they're actually, it was mostly women, but we did have some men in the study as well. Um, one is, I feel like I'm tempting fate when I say I've survived it. And this is a common one um, that I hear from my patients is that they're, it, it's like that um, kind of superstition worried that they're tempting fate by saying that they've survived it. Um, it seems misleading or inaccurate as cancer can always come back. You know, so this worry that their cancer might come back and calling themselves a survivor is like, how do they know that? And it makes them feel uneasy. Um, another one is I don't deserve to carry the title proudly because I didn't suffer enough to deserve it. And this is one that's common as well for people who have either earlier stage disease or, you know, they feel like their treatment went easy. It's like I didn't, you know, earn that term survivor. Um, and then the flip side of that is another one. The word survivor has nothing to do with how hard an individual has to fight the disease. Survivor to me is a passive word. Fighting and overcoming cancer is pretty active. So it's actually the reverse. And this, I think, ties back to Dr. Barry's you know, statement that when you use a single label to, you know, just um, put a swath across, you know, such a diverse number one group of people with, you know, different types of cancer, but also every individual interprets their experience differently. And this single term, they can have reactions that are almost seem quite opposite, but just demonstrating that there's this dis-ease with the using that term and applying it to them if they have not chosen it themselves. Um, just curiously, um, now this paper, as I said, was very powerful to me, um, as the authors of this paper, um, you know, what were the reverberations of, of, um, of the paper in our community? I mean, were you able to present this to Astro? Um, or were you able, did you get feedback from, from people, any pushback, um, um, you know, any death threats? No, I'm only kidding. Um, you know, any, uh, you know, any, I guess, vocal or, or uh, uh, vigorous pushback? Not, not to my knowledge. That doesn't mean that uh, there weren't people that read the paper and said, this is rubbish, because that's just part of the part of the process of publishing and putting your work out there. And, and, you know, uh, hopefully in a very constructive and professional way, because that certainly was our goal, we did critique the existing literature. 
And so I suspect that some of the original researchers of those papers, if they came across our paper, uh, weren't, uh, weren't uh, thrilled <laughs> with, uh, with what we did. But on the contrary, Tom, uh, the feedback we've had uh, that I've had, and I know Katie has had too, uh, and we've shared it widely, our, our author group, we put it on social media and, uh, and in other ways. We, there's been some publicity about it. There's been some interviews that have been published uh, that we have done about the study. Uh, the feedback has, has been, uh, from my standpoint, very, very positive. And uh, even the Nancer, uh, the, 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 again, the National Cancer Institute, NCI, which has traditionally uh, uh, defined cancer survivor almost word for word as the Mullen group did. Uh, people with diagnosed with cancer, as long as they are alive, are cancer survivors. Uh, when I, I took it on my um, I, I, I took it on myself to send the paper to the head of the Office of Cancer Survivorship. They actually have an NCI uh, government agency. They have an Office of Cancer Survivorship. They use the term, as do many uh, cancer centers use the term. And uh, it led to, uh, I had very good um, email conversations with the head of N NCI's office of survivorship, and it led to consideration, uh, our paper, among other papers, to a rewriting of their definition. And they didn't uh, totally write it the way I would have written it or Katie would have written it, but it's progress. And so I was, I was kind of proud of that. Yeah, and, and while you should be, it, it, it is a tremendous paper. It is a very valuable paper, a very valuable piece of work. Um, are you guys planning on doing any follow-up, uh, you know, to this study? Um, you know, uh, any, um, maybe to include, um, you know, a more diverse group of, uh, of patients, um, men, um, patients that are, um, you know, more um, just say, you uh, less have less less access you know to to some of the um i guess the way you guys put it was it was mostly a a pretty non-colored i guess you would say non you know not a very homogeneous group mm -hmm. um you know any thoughts or follow-up to the study in that regard Well, the, uh, the study should be followed up, and we end our paper with recommending that more research be done with different populations, different cancers. Uh, and and we, we believe that our findings will hold up in these subsequent studies, and we say that uh, in our article in the conclusion, but we do uh, recommend that that the research be followed up. And we're hoping that others will, uh, that they might use our same methodology because uh, I, I am confident that we have a, uh, a very strong methodology for this particular paper. The limitation is that our sample is uh, primarily breast cancer patients. That's the limitation. And we, uh, we fess up to that limitation in, in the paper. We, we note that, uh, but uh, the methodology itself, I believe is, is, is quite strong and, and superior to the kind of binary type of studies that Katie was mentioning and some of the other uh, studies that had uh, different uh, limitations. Uh, Katie and I continue to write together, but we've been we've tackled we've been tackling some other topics. She's a designer. Yes, uh, you know. And we're going to beg her uh, to come on uh, another podcast to talk about um, her line for breast cancer patients, and um, cannot wait to do that. Um, if you would consider that, it would be again a double honor. Yeah. So knowing I, I, Katie and I. 
Katie, I think we've done three or four papers together for something like that uh, together so far that we've published. But knowing Katie was a designer, uh, I was planning a paper on using the principles of evidence-based design to uh, better design cancer centers, which have unique needs in terms of the physical facility and the way they're designed, particularly as rapidly as cancer care is changing. And uh, so I recruited an architect that only designs cancer centers uh, very, and very, very fine, uh, very fine uh, uh, professional in architecture. And we had a we had uh, another a doctor in addition to Katie, but I really wanted Katie on this project because of her interest in design. And it turned out to be uh, another successful paper. We got it published in a good journal and had a lot of good feedback on it. So Wonderful. And um, in, in closing, I wanted to ask if you guys um, had any uh, thoughts you wanted to share before we close out. Um, oh, Turn it over to Katie, let her be the closer. Yeah, well, I first want to thank you for inviting us to come on and being open to, you know, hearing more about this paper. And, and really, as you said, you know, leading into this interview is that this was, you know, kind of a shock for you that someone would come and maybe challenge the term. And so I really appreciate you being open to this. I think, you know, this is the start of a conversation, but I think the more we can listen to those people who are experiencing an illness um, and really trying to understand what they need and what they want, you know, that's how we get closer to the best ways to help and serve them. So um, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share this work. Just tremendous, tremendous podcast. Um, again, the, the the key point here for for our constituency um, is is very simple. Um, being open, as you said, to allowing the cancer patient to really define how they want to be defined, and to respect that. And if survivor fits, fantastic. If conqueror fits fantastic. Um, if Amazon princess of the jungle fits, fantastic. It is irrelevant. What is relevant is that you got us thinking. Angel, do you have anything to add to this amazing podcast? I will tell you as someone who is on the outside, um, it made me put, put me in a, a different um, outlook as to what what the word survivor is and, and how we uh, have to be open-minded. And we have to take the opportunity to really understand the patient because in, in reality, that's what it's all about. It's that's what it's care. all about. Exactly. I am very grateful to you both. I am going to absolutely haunt you and stalk you uh, until you agree to come back on to the program. Um, I want to take this opportunity. This is your friend, Dr. Tommy and Ellie signing off on another podcast. I'm very grateful to Dr. Lenberry, Dr. Katie Deming, Angel Santana on my left, Rod Freeman, um, Small Biz Up, and all of our great sponsors. And guys, I can't wait till you hear this. This is going to be amazing. God bless, peace, and um, we will talk offline. <laughs>